All right. So go ahead and get started. Um, title of my talk, Splunk Like a Boss. This is threat hunting with the Splunk Bots data set. I'm Matt Brenton. Um, I changed my Twitter handle just to be annoying. It's now Chupa Thingy with a uh, one, because Chupa Thingy without a one is taken by a guy who's never tweeted. Not that I'm bitter. That's me. Um, I'm a Chihuahua hoarder. I like mountain biking, and I'm close personal friends with Herky. I'm kind of a big deal. No. <laughs> Okay, so um, overview of my talk. First, I'm going to start by going over Splunk bots overview and a little bit on my lab setup. Um, then I'll be talking about the threat hunting process. And lastly, I'll give a demo on threat hunting using the Splunk uh, bots data set. So first, overview and lab setup. What is Splunk? Um, I'm sure most people here have heard of Splunk, but um, sim, big data, operational intelligence, um, lots of buzzwords there. Um, the description they have on their website is search, analyze, and visualize machine data generated by IT s systems and infrastructure. Um, kind of the key thing there is they take machine data and turn it into process data. So you add fields, um, extract fields, um, make it so that you can, you can search on the data in a meaningful fashion. Um, allows you to search, alert, and uh, in some cases you can predict. Uh, bots. Bots is the boss of the SOC. It was originally developed uh, as a CTF for uh, the 2016 Splunk conference. Um, it's a data set that you can load in and play with that they've released now. Um, and it's made to be all of the data sources that you need in order to uh, perform incident response and hunting. So um, uh, shout out to the guys who wrote it down there at the bottom. Um, I know at least Ryan's on Twitter. How do I get it? Uh, Splunk, it's easy. Splunk.com forward slash download. Um, you have to create an account, it's free. It's easy. Um, bots data set, direct link is github.com forward slash Splunk forward slash bots v1. So lab components. Um, my lab that I set up, I started with an Ubuntu 18.04.1 LTS uh, image. I worked with uh, Splunk Enterprise 721. I think it's still the most current. I set this up a couple weeks ago, but I think they come out with a lot of updates, but I think it's still the most recent. Um, Splunk bots v1 data set and all of the apps and add-ons listed on the page. So uh, first step, create a new VM. Um, again, I used Ubuntu 18.04. Minimum specs, uh, according to Splunk, are 12 cores, 12 gigs of RAM, and 800 IOPS. You don't really need that for a test environment. That's, that's more for like good performance in an enterprise environment. So um, I, I just went ahead and went with two cores and four gigs of RAM. Um, kind of the big thing to look out for is the, the data set is, is big. So uh, the compressed data set is under, just under seven gigs. Um, and then when you decompress it, it's um, you know, 18 gigs or so. So um, by the time you decompress it, you're taking up 25 gigs. So you, you can't do it with a 20 gig disk. I tried, I had to resize it. So uh, go with 30 or 40. Installing Splunk, uh, first thing you want to do, we're security people, secure your lab. UFW is what uh, um, Ubuntu 18 uses by default, so that's what I used. Um, default allow outgoing, default deny incoming, and because I was setting this up to emulate uh, an enterprise uh, deployment, I allowed 22 and 8,000 in. 22 is SSH, 8,000 is for the web portal. Next thing you want to do is de-secure your lab. So install OpenSSH server. It's not installed by default on 18.04. Again, if you're, if you're not um, SSHing in, you don't need to do that stuff. Uh, next, create a Splunk user. Um, that command right there will give you a Splunk user named Splunk, uh, home directory of opt Splunk, and uh, bash shell. Next, you want to install Splunk as the user Splunk. That's key. Um, so a lot of people get caught up on this. They'll try, they'll run the installer as root and then you, you have some permission issues. Splunk does not recommend running as root. You want to run as a separate non-privileged user. So um, untar the, uh, the Splunk TGC. Uh, dash C tells it where to, go, uh, where to untar it and you want to uh, untar it to forward slash opt. Um, the default installation directory is opt Splunk. 
So that'll put it there. And then uh, the, the command to start the, the service, op splunk bin splunk start. So that installation process will kick off. Um, it'll start with a, a, um, a license agreement. And then one of the, the first things it'll have you do is create a new user. Um, so the, the user that you created on the previous step is, is on the Linux system. Um, the user you create on this step is actually for logging into the web portal. It's, a, it's an actual Splunk user. Um, most people just go ahead and name them Splunk and give them the same password. So um, at that point, once you get done with the installation process, it'll uh, start your process, log into your, your um, put your um, IP colon 8000 in your address bar. It should take you to something like this. And the boom, we did it. We're done. We have Splunk. So next, configure Splunk. Um, we're security people. Again, enable HTTPS. It's HTTP by default. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. Go into the web portal, settings, server settings, general settings. Click the radio button for enable SSL. Uh, most critical step here is you want to install Vim. It's really the only text editor you should be using. <laughs> so uh, install it. And then for good measure while you're there, you should alias nano to uh, our MRF root, no preserve root, because people who use nano are wrong and they should be punished. OK, um, next you want to install all your Splunk apps. So this is the list. Uh, this is a screenshot directly from the GitHub page for uh, bots. Um, what the, the current versions are as of the time I installed this about two weeks ago, uh, listed there. The, the good thing is that, that most of the Splunk apps are really good about remaining backwards compatible. So um, I didn't run into any issues working with the data set, even though some of those uh, versions are quite a bit newer. Um, the data set is about two years old. Uh, or it's two and a half years old because it was released in 2016, mid-2016. Um, example of an app page, this is what the Fortinet FortiGate app looks like. Um, get there by just clicking the link uh, from the bots page. Um, pretty easy to download. All you have to do is click the green download button. You'll have to log in, but um, you should have done that. You should have created a Splunk account when you downloaded the Splunk Enterprise, but um, it's free. Once you have downloaded it, uh, it downloads as a TGZ. So uh, go into your web portal, hit the uh, Manage Apps uh, cog in the upper left. That brings up the Apps page. Click Install App from a file. Brings you to the next page to upload the app. Choose your file, upload it. If you're upgrading, you won't be in this case, but check the box if you're upgrading. Pretty easy. So that was that process. Um, Kind of the key thing is uh, about half the apps are going to tell you you need to restart. Um, you can wait till the end and then restart. Um, bots data set, it, it's uh, delivered as an app. But again, it's, it's over 6 gigs. And every time I tried to install it via the, the command line or uh, via the, the web interface, it failed. So I had to upload it and install it via the terminal. Um, and, it's, and again, since I was uh, kind of interfacing with it from my host machine, um, I ended up SFTPing over it to temp. Um, if you're if you're doing this all on your uh, Ubuntu or whatever you choose to use, uh, just you know, untar it. But big thing is you want to untar it um, to opt Splunk Etsy apps. That is the default apps directory, so you want to put it there. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and um, go into your web portal and run a new search. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but um, what you want to run is index equals bots v1 and space earliest equals zero. And as long as you get data, then you know you've done everything right, or at least you have the data set, the data set involved or installed. Um, if you let it run for a little bit and you click the source type, you should see something like that, about 13 source types. Um, again, the, the numbers are gonna be off. There's, there's something like, I don't know, there's over 5 million events. And uh, one, one day I was playing with it, I decided to just let it run and see how long it would take. And I think it took like, almost half an hour to, to go through all the events with that command. So there's a lot there. So next, threat hunting process. What is threat hunting? I like this definition. Uh, it's a focused and iterative approach to searching out, identifying, and understanding adversaries internal to the defender's networks. This is from Rob Lee. He's a SANS instructor. Um, really kind of the, the, the key words there are focused and iterative. Um, Another thing that, that a lot of people have, uh, a lot of definitions include is that it's, it's kind of a human-driven exercise. It's not something you can, you can do using 
you know, rules and, and machine learning and whatnot. So a couple assumptions that come with uh, threat hunting. First is the attacker is on your network. Second is your detection tools failed. So distinction, uh, hunting is not incident response. Scott Roberts defines the definition as uh, kind of in reactive organizations, an incident starts when a notification comes in. In proactive or hunting organizations, the IR team actively goes looking for incidents based on known patterns of activity, intelligence, or even just hunches. Once the hunt team finds a new incident, they begin IR as usual. What isn't threat hunting? Um, this comes from a, a recent blog post for a, from Richard Baitlick. Um, he he kind of makes a distinction between IOC-centric analysis, which he calls matching, and IOC-free analysis, which he, he then calls hunting. Um, I, th I think it's I think this definition is a little pedantic. It's um, again, y you don't you can't just take a list of IOCs and and put it in a system and call it threat hunting. Um, and I think that's really where he's getting, but. But you'll see that during the process of threat hunting, you will, you will find IOCs and you'll use that to enrich your data and kind of enrich your searches. So um, using IOCs doesn't make it not threat hunting. But, um, you know, I, I think he does have a little bit of a point that you, don't, you can't just take a, a, a list of bad domains and call it threat hunting, you know. So anybody identify what that is? It's a scientific method also known as the threat hunting process. So uh, I've, I've watched a number of talks about the threat hunting process and, and a lot of them come, come down to basically the scientific method. So um, scientific method is identify the problem, gather data, make a hypothesis, test your hypothesis, which is your experiment. Does the new data agree? Yes, continue testing. No, make a new hypothesis. So threat hunting, start with the problem. Uh, typical problems are target centric or actor centric. Target centric would be, I have this really cool thing on my network that all the bad guys want. That's a target. Or actor centric is APT42 does this. Hypothesis, APT42 pwned us by doing this. Um, I'm going to go with uh, DNS tunneling. So my hypothesis is they pwned us by using DNS tunneling. For my hypothesis, I would develop an experiment. How would I investigate? whether APT42 used DNS tunneling. And then kind of the key thing is, uh, based on your findings, either you, know, you find evidence of DNS tunneling, good. If not, you need a new hypothesis. Um, and as you, as you go through your process, you should be finding IOCs, you should be finding, as you find data, pivot off of it. So good example of the threat hunting process from Chris Sanders. Uh, this is threat hunting for HTTP user agents. Uh, identify pro step, ha attackers frequently use HTTP to facilitate malicious network communication. From that, he developed a hypothesis. If I find an unusual user agent string in HTTP traffic, I may have discovered a hack, an attacker. In order to test that, he aggregated and analyzed the user agent field in all HTTP traffic for a specific time window. Um, down there at the bottom, you get the link to the blog post. Uh, basically, those were his findings. He, he went and did a reverse sort on the, uh, or he did a sort on the user agents, find the ones that were the least common. I think the one he ended up focusing on was the second one on that list. Um, does an analysis on it using useragentstring.com, kind of breaks it down, and in his blog post, he goes over why it's a kind of a weird user agent. And then from there, he's able to pivot and say, okay, this user agent is tied to this IP, and from there, I can find... Um, you know, domains and other, other things related to that IP activity. So that's how he was able to pivot just from saying, okay, I'm looking for weird user agents. So that brings us to the demo. Demo gods be kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not important. My super long password. Okay, so that's super big. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna be poking this and playing with this. So um, here we go. I've got this is my terminal. You see here, and mouse is doing funny things. So here's where I did my opt splunk bin splunk start. Um, this all looks pretty good. They have some sort of cheeky message they always start with, and then go through your tests. Uh, main thing you want to see is this, waiting for the web server to be available, done. Um, if you see failed there, you've got a problem. 
Um, and here it just says, hey, go here. So done that. I've already logged in. I went to search. I'm here on my new search. So um, I'm kind of zoomed in, so you're not going to see the whole, the whole page. But um, there I'm just doing index equals bots v1, earliest equals zero. Earliest uh, overwrites my, my, my time settings. So it says uh, start from the earliest event you have and move forward. So big thing here you're going to notice is um, you're going to see this, these events going through. You see the number going up. Uh, not going up super fast. We're at 30,000 right now. Um, we'll see data over here in the raw field. And on the left, we'll start to see some uh, fields start to appear as it identifies different data. Um, here you see those 13 source types that I mentioned earlier. That's just kind of an indicator that, that this is working, this is doing what we expect it. So um, again, this is a costly search because we're looking at every single raw event and it, it will take five ever. So um, what we want to do when we're threat hunting is you want to characterize your data, but when you're working with a massive data set, you, you, you just can't sit there for half an hour and wait for it to load. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a different command. Um, what I'm using here is I am starting with a pipe. That means this is a generated command. So I'm getting rid of the, the implicit search and I'm using the metadata command. Um, it's one of the um, one of the generating commands. Another one is, is tstats, uh, dbinspect. Um, and this just uses the metadata. So right now we've got 188,000 events. It's been going for, you know, a little while. Let's start this one. There we go, we're done. So. I have my total events, but that's all of them. It's like over 5 million events it looked at. Um, and here we see, uh, anyone here read ebook time? Want to translate? No? Okay. Um, just want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. We'll make Splunk do the work for us. So um, command that I like to use is convert C time. So, um, there are a number of ways to convert epoch to, to uh, human readable, but convert C time, give it the field first time, and overwrite the field value. So do that, and now I've got easier to read fields. Yeah, so big takeaway here, and I know it's kind of hard to read, and I'm trying to focus in and, and still display the information, but um, Common, common thing we'll see is uh, 7.31.2016 is our start time, 8.28.2016 is our end time, thereabouts. Uh, the recent time is the most recent time that the uh, file was updated. Um, it's not as important as the last event time. And then we see here our different source types. So um, we see we have wind event logs, uh, FGT, those are FortiGate. So we've got event traffic, UTM. IIS logs, Nessus scan, and then a bunch of uh, network data. So we've got DHCP, DNS, HTTP. Um, other thing we can do here is we can also look at sources. That's kind of hard to see there. Oh, damn, I did it right. So we can do metadata type source, source type, metadata type sources, and metadata type hosts. So sources is going to be similar. But um, sometimes you get, you get kind of better granularity out of sources. Uh, main thing here is win event logs. Instead of just showing up as win event log, they were all the same source type. But if you look at the source, you can see we have application, we have security, and we have system. Um, some of the stuff doesn't look as good. So these are our Nessus scans. Our Nessus scans looked good in source type and source stayed, um, you know, that's not really as usable unless you're targeting a specific host. Uh, stream stuff kind of looks the same. The other one we can do is hosts. And we can see here we have a lot of hosts, 1,764 hosts. Um, so probably not the best method to just go ahead and start looking at each individual host. That might take a little while. So um, I propose we do something different. But um, you know, one of the things I did, uh, and every, every time you make a table in Splunk, you can, you can kind of interact with it directly. So um, go ahead and sort by total count. First one that comes up is 192.168.250.1. Um, it's kind of like, that one's got a lot of count. I kind of wonder what that is. So went ahead, threw a search, and I figure, how do I figure out what that is? 
I look for that host and look for source types that are associated. But again, because this is like this is a normal search, you can see it's kind of cranking through that data. So that's going to take a while. Um, better way to do that. Again, we want a generating event. We want to look at metadata, T stats. So T stats count where index equals bots v1. That's the host, and I want to know by source type. So that that went through all 500,000 events, pretty much instantaneously. Um, looking at that. All I see is FGT source type. Um, that's a forty gate. That's our that's our uh, IDS or our um, our network device. So also, it's uh, kind of interesting to point out here that uh, in Splunk searches in SPL is the search language. There is an implicit AND. So this search is the same as that search. Um, you can also use OR. You can use other kind of comparison operators. You can use parentheses. You can use equal to, not equal to, contains, doesn't contain, uh, where, by. Um, kind of interesting thing though is and and or need to be in all caps. So you can see that's all, that's kind of orange. If I type it without all orange, it's not going to identify it as an operator. But where is this lowercase? Yep, where and by can be lowercase. A bunch of as can be lowercase. I'm, I'm not sure why and and or get, get picked on. So um, let me go back. So now I've kind of characterized my data. Uh, looking at the source types, looking at the uh, source types and sources, I can kind of tell what's going on here. So source types, again, I've got win event log. Um, I'm kind of going to focus on, I think, you know, we could find some interesting stuff here. Uh, DNS, HTTP. Um, Samba, probably some interesting stuff there. And then same with uh, looking at the sources, um, security logs, Sysmon. I think I think we can definitely find some good stuff in here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pick one. And for the purpose of this exercise, I chose DNS. So go up here. Uh, <coughs> my search just says index bots v1. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then my source type is stream DNS, and I'm piping that into the field summary command. And this is going to be tough. Oh, okay, good. It popped out right. So because um, I'm not giving it an earliest anymore, I'm going to go ahead and just give it an all time. Or no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to give it an all time because I know my date range. So um, because we know the date range, I'm going to go ahead and put it in here go between, what was it, 7, 731, 2016, and it was, I think it's 828, 2016. So click apply. Whenever you adjust the time range, it runs the search that you have in the search field. So I don't have to search again. So this is another one of those costly searches. Um, but the neat thing about this is I'm just looking at the fields. And Splunk is telling me a number of things about them. It's telling me count, distinct count is exact, max, mean, min, uh, numeric quantity, uh, numeric count, standard deviation, and values. So uh, kind of the cool thing about Splunk is we've got a numeric field over here. It's actually on the fly. It's calculating max, mean, min, standard deviation. So you will see those, as it searches, you will see those values update. That's not just something that Splunk has stored somewhere. That's something it's actually calculating as it searches. So that's pretty cool. But what we're doing here is we're just really looking for the, the field and the values. So I'm actually, because our screen's so small, I'm going to go with table, field, values. I don't care about the other ones, other values. So there we have, I've got my field, and I've got my values. So I can, I can take a look at that, and I could see, OK, what's, what's, this, uh, what's this source type have that's interesting? So I see answer. That could be, that could be interesting. Um, app, they're all DNS. Bytes, uh, I'm not really looking at bytes right now. Um, let me go down a way, because I know what I'm looking for, and I'm not going to waste your time. So um, dest, dest is interesting. Uh, Main thing I decided to focus on is query. Uh, that's got the DNS query. That's what I want to know.
So I got another search I'm going to run. If I can find my mouse, I go all the way back to the top. So modify that search, pair it in a bit. Record type equals A, and I want the stats count by query. And I threw a sort on the end there. Um, so that is doing sort by count. So that is going to be an ascending sort. So here I've got my query. And here I've got my count. Um, the sort's going to kind of get screwed up as the search goes on because it's not, it's going to wait till the end of the search to sort. Um, so there are two fields in here. There's query by itself and then there's query with the brace. Um, I just chose query with the brace. Um, actually looking at the, if you look at the, um, where was it, the, um, the field summary, you'll see that they have the exact same count and the exact same distinct count. So um, it's, they're both the exact same field. I think the, the query it might be uh, with the brace might be, um, Splunk will automatically do some key value sort of extraction. Um, and then I think query without the brace was either aliased or um, um, specifically extracted. So um, we'll let that stop and see. Okay, so I'm stopping that early because I don't want to just sit up here and let it spin, but um, we look, here's kind of our low numbers of queries. And some of you guys might say, hey, something there doesn't look right. But, um, you know, instead of, instead of just kind of manually looking through everything, let's, let's use uh, some Splunk magic to do the work for us. So um, this was uh, shamelessly borrowed from one of the Splunk, Splunk threat hunting blogs. Um, what I'm doing here is same search as before, index bots v1s, uh, source type stream equals, or stream DNS, record type A. Um, I'm doing a table with the query. And then I'm using the, the URL toolkit, which was one of the apps that was installed, um, to, to parse out that domain. So it's breaking it out into subdomain, domain, domain without T TLD, and TLD. And um, there in the middle where it says search UT domain none, or d is not none, and then not, that all that's doing is saying, I don't care about it if it's got um, Microsoft as the domain, MSN is the domain, Akamai Edge is the domain. So I'm, I'm kind of filtering out all the stuff that I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, I, I don't care about this because I know it's good. Um, the really interesting thing we're doing here is this UT Shannon. Um, what that is, is it's a, it's a Shannon entropy function. So um, I should have run that while I was talking. But um, so I'm running that, that right now. And the, the way the Shannon entropy works is they've, they've got a, uh, a number of blog posts all about it. Um, they even have like entire presentations just on the Shannon entropy, but it really kind of triggers on um, long, unique fields. So um, that's going to catch kind of our, our weird, like computer generated domain names that um, we all know as security people are, are kind of, uh, you know, you look at that and you're like, that's fishy. But this is kind of a programmatic way to filter those up to the top. So I'm going to stop it early again, but we'll see what it, what it turned up with. So um, kind of zoom out all the way. So this Shannon value over here, it's a numeric value. Uh, we did a negative sort on that, so we're starting with the highest value. And we're going down. Um, and we've got it all broken out. Here's the query, subdomain, domain, domain without TLD, TLD. Um, so what's that? I don't honestly know. I've seen some numbers as high as like six and some as low as one. Um, I think it's logarithmic, so it's um, you probably don't see super high numbers. And the numbers kind of go up exponentially. That's... Um, as much as I'm willing to say about logarithms, because I don't, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> but um, kind of looking to here at what kind of filtered to the top, and um, the one that I decided to focus on, if I can find it, is this guy right here. So that's one that showed up earlier during my my sort, but um, you know, I I was like, that's that's just not right. That looks shady. So next time I'm going to say, okay. I want to know who's talking to that domain because I think something's wrong with that computer. So same search as before, DNS record, type A. Uh, and now I'm looking specifically for this query and I'm making a table time source desk query. 
So run that. Not a lot of events there, so it returns pretty quick. But see here, um, see our table. Um, our initial, and it's sorted reverse by time. Um, 250.100 made a query to 250.20. 250.20 made a number of external queries. Based on that, I'm assuming that 250.20 is a DNS server, and 250.100 is actually the, the, the host that we're interested in, or um, you know, otherwise the IP making the initial request. So um, we also have a time to pivot from now. We got 2016, 08, 24, uh, 1215. So I am gonna go, next thing I wanna do is I say, okay, I suspect something's wrong with that host. So my next search is going to be that host. I want to know everything that host requested from DNS um, on that day or later. So I just gave it, I said earliest is 824, 2016 at zero o'clock. Um, I didn't do a latest. So, because that's pretty towards the end of the data set. And um, I know from running it that we're only going to have stuff on that day. So. Um, Here's this day, sorted in first time order. Um, got, that's kind of an interesting looking domain. So I don't think that, that really looks legit. IPinfo.io, questionable. Shell.windows.com, I looked that up. That's, um, that's what uh, DNS or Windows looks for when you try and execute something that it doesn't have a known handler for. So that means this person clicked on something that Windows, their Windows system hadn't seen before. Here's our shady domain. And then we see WPAD and ISOTAP. Uh, WPAD and ISOTAP are, uh, I think it's ISOTAP is IPv6 tunneling, and WPAD is um, proxying. So when you see that, that's a, that's a system looking for an IPv6 tunnel or a proxy. Uh, kind of suspicious that we see that after this shady domain. Um, another thing that, that I think is worth noting here is uh, we see this host, presumably an internal host, looking for another internal host. So that would be something that I'd want to note and say, okay, I'm going to look at what happened on that system later. But due to time constraints, we're just going to move forward with our initial guy. So um, next thing I decided to do is I look at that, that time range and I say, okay, this all takes place on 824 from 1130 to 1330. So, um, I'm going to look for other logs that might tell me what's going on. I'm going to look at Sysmon. So I've got to give it what time range? That's too many digits. We know 824, 11, 30. Eight twenty four. Wrong button. 13, 30, 30. There we go. So again, I'm, I'm trying to pare down that time window because I really don't want, you know, there's going to be a lot of sysmon events. And I'm really concerned about that host during that time window. And again, here we go. Uh, sysmon is my source. I've got to give it the index. Uh, source IP is that IP. That's all I'm doing. Um, so again, this is another one of those expensive searches. But it gives us a lot of interesting data. So 52,666 events. Um, here's a graph of when those events happened. That's pretty unusual to see a 20,000 event spike, a 13,000 event spike, and a 16,000 event spike when our baseline is 5, 10, 4, 3, 4. So something, something weird's going on here. Um, again, it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but um, over here on the left, we can see our, our fields. These are interesting fields. So um, on this one, I decided that, um, you know, I'm kind of clicking through here, dest, it's kind of spread out, um, app. Huh, one app is 92% of the values. So um, I want to take a closer look at app. Sure, we can see it there. Um, I like the tables. So I'm just going to go here and I'm going to go stats. Count by app. So that gives me a table. Here's my app. There's my count. Of course, I got to zoom out to show it to you. But um, it's the same information, but it's a different display. And again, I'm, I'm seeing this this really high count for this app. So 
take a look at that. And uh, anybody think that looks kind of suspicious? That the app that's in 94% of the Sysmon values is uh, osk.exe, which is the on-screen keyboard. Um, normally it does not run out of the, the uh, user's app data roaming directory. So that's a little suspicious. Um, so from here, we've identified, um, you know, went from DNS, and now we're on, we've got a suspicious executable, osk.exe, and we've got a user, because it's running out of Bob Smith's directory. So next thing I decided, I'm like, hey, um, Bob Smith is doing weird stuff. Let's look at what else Bob Smith is doing. I want to know what else is coming from his computer. So I'm going to look at Sysmon events again, same source IP, um, but I'm looking at, oops, I did not get my, my full command here. Um, well first, I'm looking specifically at the on-screen keyboard, um, which actually, instead of typing that in, I can just click this. I can go view events. So that's the, the search I was trying to type. Um, that brings it back, only that app. So again, I go back over here to the fields, and I say, OK, what's interesting here? Um, I see dest. Um, this is interesting because 100% of the values contain dest. Um, so looking at this closer, that tells me that this is all network traffic. Um, On-screen keyboard doesn't really use the network that much. Um, so I'm going to look at that a little closer. Um, dest port, there's two values. That's really strange. So I've got two values here for dest port, 100% of the events again. 99.998% of them are going to port 6892. That port corresponds to BitTorrent and Windows Live Messenger file transfer. One is going to port 80. I think that's interesting. I'm going to look at that. Um, kind of the main thing I saw here is, where is it? So I've got a destination IP. I'm going to look at that. I think anything talking to that IP from my network, I, I'm going to take a closer look at that because I think that's shady. So now I'm going to expand it back out. And I'm going to say, OK, our user Bob, he's compromised. Let's see what else is running from his system. So go back to that initial search. And all I did was take uh, my, my app, and I chopped off the end. So uh, Splunk supports wildcards. I put a star there on the end. What else is running during this time? So go back down. We got two apps. We got another app here. Roaming, 12.12.14.temp. That seems a little weird. So I'm going to take a look at that guy. And what I can do there, just click that. So again, I'm going back, I'm saying, okay, now I'm looking at this. Um, you know, I can, I can look through this data. It's kind of hard to read, but I see task scheduler. That's usually legit, totally legit. CMD.exe, oh, seems, seems uh, definitely normal. But um, yeah, so I'm going to see, I, I kind of want to parse this more. So I'm going to look at kind of interesting fields here. So um, this command line field, that looks pretty interesting. Um, also, I can come down here, um, and I got to this, this, this view is just all the fields and all the events. Um, and I see I've got parent process ID. I've got, pro I've got parent process ID. I've got parent command line. That tells me what, what started this process. That's interesting. Um, so let's make this more readable and look at what we're, we're really interested in. So next search I'm going to do is if my copy paste will cooperate. I'm going back up here to the top and I want to look for anything that is that that 12 12 14 dot temp. I'm looking for anywhere that shows up in my sysmon logs and I'm looking for anything that has parent command line or command line. That's seven events. Um, so I, yeah, I, that's not, that's not a good way to look at this. So let's make this readable. Let's sort it. Let's use Splunk. There we go. So all this search is doing, 
Um, again, same search, 12, 12, 14, parent command line. I'm making a table, time process, process ID, parent process, parent process ID, command line, and parent command line. So this one's kind of going to be hard to read because you got to make it wide enough to see what's going on. But um, I'm sorted here by time. So my earliest events are at the bottom here. But I've got my process ID. I've got my parent process. Um, you know, this anybody that's that's done kind of like a, a memory analysis, malware analysis, stuff like that. Um, you know, this should look really kind of strange to you. You should say, okay, this is this is definitely malware. Um, but I'm going to go to my 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 first event that I've got, and so that one is this one right here. Um, I can tell that because these two have the same same timestamp. This one is the parent of this one. So this is the parent process, and I can get its parent, which tells me that wscript.exe ran 20429.vbs. So I want to figure out where that came from. That's weird. So now I'm going to do a search again on 2049vbs. So same search as that last one. Only thing that changed is instead of looking for that 121214.tmp, uh, I'm looking for 20429.vbs. And here we go. Does that look does that look normal to you guys? <laughs> yeah, I, I obfuscate all my sys tools, all my system administration tools. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's hard to see, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nobody can figure out your code. They can't fire you. So that's huge. That's, that's weird. So again, um, showed you the process. I started with a, an assumption that I'm going to see strange traffic in DNS and kind of work my way through there and came up with this uh, VBS script that uses obfuscation and kind of kicked off this whole malicious process. So... And one thing that, um, this is that, that 121214.tmp. Um, one of the cool things about Sysmon is I've got hashes in there. There's an MD5 hash. So I went ahead and I put that into Google. And that's what came up. Um, mdrop, server, server, Bieber malware. I think that's a user. That's kind of sad. I thought it was called Bieber malware. I got excited. <laughs> So I think the second link down um, started reading about it and it says drops a, uh, drops a VB script file. It's a random name, app data random. Um, launched using W script. That looks like what we saw. Um, so got some more intel though here. Um, downloads an image file called mhtr.jpg. So that's definitely something I should look for. Um, JPEG image is downloaded from URL Solidar proximity. Um, I'm sure I butchered that, but uh, we saw that in our logs. So, um, and then we have here, if it can't be reached, if it can't reach that domain, it uses this IP. So, um, again, it's kind of an example of how you can use threat intel and IOCs to enrich your hunt. So, um, you know, I didn't just take this data and say, okay, I'm going to create alerts based off this. But based on what I'm seeing on my network, you bet I'm going to look at this stuff. Uh, that's kind of hard to read, but that's from the Beaver malware. Um, this guy's got a hash for every, every different part. He's got the dropper. Um, and you can't, again, you can't really see it, but that, that hash, this, uh, ARP, I think it's ARP or APR, I'm not sure, really sure. Yeah. ARP.exe, that matches the hash that, that we found. Um, so, want to learn more? Um, what I discovered throughout this process is every time I kind of, uh, got to, a, got to something, I'm like, okay, wouldn't it be cool if I could do this? And I Googled it. I kept coming up with these hunting with Splunk blogs. Um, so there's actually a whole series of blog articles started in 2017, July of 2017, where they go through this process and teach you how to threat hunt with Splunk. Um, I knew where they were there. I didn't really read them before this, I'm going to be honest. But um, as I was going through it, um, like the DNS one, I found a great blog post on how to search DNS logs and applying that Shannon entropy. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally going to use that. But um, you know, they, they go through in each blog post, they kind of focus on just a different source type and, and say, okay, how are we going to look at this? Um, and even when I when I did a Google search for the 121214.tmp, 
Uh, one of the first hits was one of these blog posts because because uh, some of it they they use this bots data set because that's their data set. So um, really, if you want to learn more, go here. Um, yeah, and and that's kind of the whole the whole reason that I I went through how to set up the lab, and and how to get started in this process is is I want it to be introductory, and I want I want people to be able to go okay I want I want to do this at home, and um, you know if you want to do that and you want you have any questions about it feel free to reach out to me, look at these blog posts um, you know if you want to work on it together let me know. I'm on Slack so that's it, chupa thingy chupa thingy, the end. Any questions? So uh, Splunk is interesting because you can, um, you know, maybe not directly in in the in the uh, Splunk, pro Splunk processing language, but um, you can write apps that use Python, that use JavaScript. Uh, you can you can incorporate all that stuff. Um, you can you can interact directly with databases. Um, it's it's um, some things are, are a little bit clunky or um, kind of you have to do a lot of work to make it work in Splunk. But um, I haven't really run into anything where I'm like I'm like I just can't do this in Splunk. And kind of one of the one of the interesting things is uh, they actually wrote the scoring engine for the the bots CTF in Splunk, and partially because the somebody somebody told them that, that they couldn't do it. So like you know forget that we're going to do that. So that's actually my next step is I'm going to download the scoring engine because they made that available. And I'm going to see how they did that because that seems really interesting. But. Um, Yeah, and, and you can have alerts that kick off, kick off scripts. Um, you can you can have uh, uh, right now I'm writing like a, a create, read, update, delete uh, dashboard in Splunk using SPL. Um, so it's it's pretty powerful. But you know there are better tools for some of that stuff. But a lot of stuff you can do in Splunk if you really want to. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys.